I, I designed a ham sandwich just for fun, uh, just to see if I could do it, and I did. So you can <laughs> you can you can design a ham sandwich in in, in Hero System, and and it'll take you about two hours to design the ham sandwich. Wow. So <laughs> two hours to design a ham sandwich. All right. So we have got with us Master Rodney Barnes. Yeah, so Rodney is an MDiv out of Western Seminary, and he is the president of the Christian Gamers Guild. So is there anything that I missed about that or that you want to plug? No, it's we've, the Christian Gamers Guild was founded uh, back in the early 90s. I think it was 94, 95, uh, primarily through back then the old... Uh, FidoNet or in the uh, the Usenet user groups and so forth back in the back in the Stone Age, they evolved into an email list and then continued on to this day as an, as an primarily an email list. Okay. We also we have a Discord server, we have a website and a Facebook group, but you know typically everything's on email. That's cool. So back then, where was was think you talked about how you were on these different forums. I'm guessing it was a lot more decentralized than it was now, whereas today we'll, we'll all just go join a Facebook group. Well, yeah, I mean, back then, you know, we were on different forum groups where originally we were on bulletin board systems. I was a sysop for, I was a sysop from 83 until 2000, uh, till 2000. And then we switched to doing pretty much everything online after that. Hmm. So for the first Four years with the Christian Gamers Guild, I was actually simulcasting the Christian Gamers Guild email list, Funnet server, Usenet server, uh, and WWIV server off off the email list onto those onto those platforms as well, which none of those exist anymore today. So, but yeah, so we we've been around for a very long time. <laughs> right, right. That's cool. If people want to join, where do they go? Um, it's the christian-gamers-guild.org, and uh, there we have all the information on how you can sign up to be part of their, our email list. We have uh, several different sub-email lists as well. We have one for prayer requests, and we have one for an ongoing long-term Bible study that our, mm. our chaplain has been running for a number of years. We also have a Discord server. It's not very active, but we do have okay. one. But also on the website, we have lots of publications. We've done a number of publications and on the Facebook group, we have a weekly, if not monthly series of publications that we put out on Facebook as well, articles and so forth. Yeah, I see. I saw that you guys maybe used to have a magazine. We did. We had a magazine for a while in the early 2000s called The Way of the Truth and Dice. I think we did. Really like clever, by the way. Yeah. We did like, I think we did like six issues or four issues, something like that. Your mission statement I found really interesting. Just the approach that you guys seem to take to gaming, it's 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 far more developed than what I see for most Christians who are gamers. What I tend to see is that people um, compartmentalize the two things. It's like, okay, well, on Sunday I'm doing the Christian thing, and when I'm doing my personal Bible reading, I'm doing the Christian thing, but you know, when I'm doing my gaming, this is, this is a separate thing that doesn't really touch my Christianity, but you guys seem to take a very integrated approach to that. It's in the constitution. It's right here. Article two, Christian gamers guild vision is to facilitate the reclamation of the imagination to be conformed to the image of Christ through the use of gaming as a creative art form. Yeah. yeah. Could you expand on that? Cause that's fascinating. Uh, it's just the idea that we believe the Imago Dei, the image of God, what really, what really, when it boils down to it, it's not intelligence that separates us from animals. It's the fact that we can create, that we can imagine and then create from that imagination. I can imagine something, think about it abstractly, put it down, design it, and then create it in reality and make that thing. And that's, it's that whole process of imagination, uh, that whole process of flowing thought. And what we thought of and what we were thinking about was um, in our hobby, 
in gaming, gaming, role playing gaming is not just a game. It's a creative art form. Mm -hmm. For role playing games, use miniatures, maps, mm -hmm. mathematical formulas, design philosophy, uh, uh, philosophy of story making. Uh, we use theology in our gaming. Everybody uses theology in their gaming, whether they realize it or not. There is a theology in an RPG, whether you realize it or not. There's a cosmology. There's uh, all of these elements that go into storytelling in addition to art, which we have in miniatures and maps and pictures mm. and character sheet designs, uh, book designs. There's, there's a whole uh, lot of art that goes into role-playing games in addition to just playing the game itself. Yeah. And so that's kind of where we, that's kind of the take we have on it is that mm -hmm. we want all of our art to conform to the image of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so if we're wanting all of our art, wanting our imaginations to conform to the image of Christ, then we want to be able to show people the image of Christ through us in that art that we're doing and so if i'm running a role-playing game as a game master for example let me give you a real concrete example if i'm running a game as a game master then as a game master the type of game master i need to be is one who is uh, love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness and self-controlled mm -hmm. that's the kind of game master i need to be and there's a lot of game masters aren't, aren't that at all <laughs> so rocks fall everyone dies <laughs> <laughs> so well maybe that maybe that's joyful never mind anyway. <laughs> it could be if the campaign's terrible yeah so when the mission statement talks about uh reclaiming the imagination that speaks to clearly a need i mean if you already have it and it's already conformed to the image of christ and there's no need to go out and bring it into submission or bring it under the authority of christ your imagination believe it or not i know it's a hard thing for people to understand but boy i tell you the bible's pretty clear on this if your imagination is part of your mind and your heart and your mind and your heart are horribly tainted by sin mm -hmm. and the fall tainted everything with death tainted everything with sin and so your imagination and your heart need to be brought in line with christ and that's done through christ's work on the cross but it's also done through sanctification to be made holy before god is done through Christ, but it's done progressively. It's done over time as you mature in Christ. Imagination is part of that. So we're trying to reclaim our imaginations for Christ. And we're gonna to try to use gaming as a means to do that. We're, we're exercising our imagination by gaming. And in the process of exercising our imagination in gaming, we're also finding things that we need to correct in our imagination. Okay, so how did you get into gaming? Uh, chess club in junior high mm -hmm. combined with uh, Boy Scouts and just uh, something in my head that said was kind of reacting to the anti- the Christian anti D and D seg sentiments. I'm like, mm -hmm. well, okay, why do Christians not like D and I'm a Christian. I don't know anything about it. So yeah. that's kind of where all that started. Back it was 1978. When I got into it. So that's early then, like really early in that hobby, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. We were we were checking books out of the library. You know, I wouldn't dare buy anything. <laughs> you know, carry them. What? Um, so we were just kids fumbling around with stuff we got from the library. Uh, we didn't really get 
serious with it until a uh, player's handbook came out, you know, a couple years later. And then I got myself a copy of the player's handbook for, for first edition and it got involved in the uh, mid Columbia war gaming society then and started running games for people that wanted to play with me okay. back in those days. Uh, in order to get players, you went to the local hobby shop uh, with your 3 by 5 card and your phone number. And you put it up on the little bulletin board and said, hey, if you're interested in playing D&D, give me a call. Now, when you talk about hobby shops back then, obviously D&D was relatively small back then, especially compared to where it is now with millions of people interested in it. But uh... Especially in Pasco, Washington. Right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> I knew that I knew that it kind of got its start out there in on the West Coast, but um, so that being said, what uh, when you went to these hobby shops and you started talking to people about playing D and D and whatever else, what what who, what were hobby shops mainly looking like back then? Because like I know me as a twenty four year old, I walk into a hobby shop and it's like, yeah, everything's D and D, everything's Magic the Gathering, everything's all this. But what was it like back then? Yeah, now it's like seventy percent Magic the Gathering. <laughs> yeah. 30% board games and 10% D&D. &D. Um, <laughs> back then, hobby shops consisted of actual hobbies. So you had the rocketry guys and the model car builder guys and the model railroad guys. And they drove the hop. The, the place we, there was really only one shop in the Tri-Cities where I grew up. And that was Noah's Ark. Um, pets and Hobbies in the mall. Pets and hobbies. Yes. It was a <laughs> pet shop and it had pet supplies and it sold pets. And the one side of the shop and the other side of the shop was rocketry, model railroad, and models, mostly models, although some really cool rocketry stuff. And then they had this one little case in the corner that had a couple of D and D books and a couple sets of dice in the case. Wow. Amazing. So when you first started playing the game, you, you're talking about like there was Christian hostility to D&D &D all the way back in 78. So oh, yeah. yeah, when you first started, what was the makeup of the people who were playing D&D? &D? Uh, mostly kids, either from the neighborhood or from people that I met from the mid-Columbia Wargaming Society, hmm. which were old school wargamers, kids, wargamers. We were playing chain mail and in mm. Napoleonic Wars and all that. And the newer games like chain mail, they were playing that too. Yeah. Back then, the newer game, you know, 72 yeah. is a newer game. Which Gary um, also had a hand in creating as well, didn't he? Right, right. And that was kind of where that started. And their kids were, you know, my age. Mm. And so the Mid Columbia War Game Society would get together and I would play with the other kids. Uh, D, &D. Mm -hmm. and some of the adults would play D, D too i i don't personally have any experience with any system other than fifth edition i'll just be honest with you all right <laughs> but i'm really interested in learning about all that and i've seen you offering to run first edition games and i would be happy to take you up on that <laughs> okay <laughs> it'd but, be a trip uh, when things started coming out about how this this game's satanic and this is you know leading kids to commit suicide and this is you know, having all these adverse effects like what was your reaction to that because i'm assuming you clearly never had any of that experience with it so no i was in high school uh in the early 80s uh when all of that really hit in the media when mothers against D, D came out with and they were all mad because one kid had committed suicide and the mother blamed D, &D for him committing suicide and uh, there were other stories like that, other things going on like that. And then, of course, all the all the lies that certain pastors told about certain people and how it, people got demon-possessed playing the game and so forth, you know, so they could sell more, you know, prayer hankies, you know, all that kind of hit in the early 80s. And what I, what I found interesting for me was I was already involved in the AD&D group in high school, we actually had a high school club and we meet for like four hours once a week. And then I was also involved in other groups on the weekend with, with the mid Columbia Working Society. And so for me, I was just busy playing. Didn't really impact me 
personally, because I was off busy playing my game. My parents asked me about it once, and I, and I said it's all hogwash. And, <laughs> you know, and and that was probably about the end of the conversation. <laughs> but, yeah. But people would ask me at church, and I would just say, you know, I would point out that, that it's a fantasy game. It's not real. And so anything happens in the game is not real. It's fake. It's make-believe. Mm. It's like acting. There's this this thing where, well, aren't you you're liking shows that have demons? Well, yes, and here's why. Because at least they're admitting there's a spiritual aspect to storytelling. Mm. Whereas you get these naturalistic stories, you know, they try to tell a story without a spiritual aspect to it. Mm. And I think they lose something. That leads us yeah. back to what, what Gary was talking about at Gen Con. And about the interaction that I had with him online, that, that was part of what we were talking about. You know, the, the presence of pagan, of at the time, dead pagan deities and, and or make-believe deities in D&D. &D. Mm -hmm. You know, and that was all part of storytelling. You can't have clerics, you can't have priests, you can't have... This whole segment that's part of building a society without some sort of spirituality behind it, without a cosmology. And one of the things that people have criticized Dungeons and Dragons about is that you're worshiping pagan, you're worshiping <laughs> pagan deities. So I'm not worshiping a pagan deity. Rodney Barnes is not worshiping a pagan deity. Yeah. You know, of course, I'm running the game, but if I were a player, I'd be saying, I'm not worshiping a pagan deity. Like, my cleric worships this fantasy deity in this fantasy world. Mm -hmm. um, but Gary wanted to make sure that we didn't have real world religion in, uh, in his games. And he, he made this brilliant statement, I thought, was that he wanted to keep sacred things sacred. Mm -hmm. And so he, he saw God, he saw faith as being something that's sacred, you know, in reality is sacred. Mm -hmm. And he didn't want to put that in an entertainment venue, you yeah. know, the game. So that was that was a big big part of the reason why we have the system for deities that we have today in D&D. &D. Mm -hmm. I would not feel comfortable, like taking control of god and like saying he would empower this or wouldn't do that like that would feel really sacrilegious i think it's more dangerous to posit a world where like we were saying earlier like where there is no supernatural element to it at all and mm -hmm. uh, there is no religion at all uh and yet you still see like a functioning society i think that's a more damaging message than to have fake deities that embody certain virtues and maybe even vices um, in the context of a fantasy fictional game. So yeah, it's cool to hear that that was the rationale that was going on even back then for Christians who were in the gaming sphere. Yeah, most people don't know that uh, Gary and Dave were Christians. Now, Gary, back in you know the early 70s, mid 70s when he was developing D&D, him and Dave Arnson were uh, the two developers of, of Dungeons and Dragons. Mm -hmm. Dave is a Christian. It was a Christian. He passed away a few years ago. Um, he he was uh, a born again believer. He was an evangelical Christian. And he, he um, was actually an elder in his uh, local church there where he lived. Yeah, that so. was so surprising to learn that you and me met because uh, you responded to my video where I was talking about how Dungeons and Dragons is a Christian game. And uh, you dropped all this knowledge on me about uh, the state of Gary Gygax's faith toward the end of his life and uh, some of the motivation for some of the game design decisions that he made. So I guess the first question that I have as touches all of that is how did you guys come into contact with Gary? Um, we ran into him, I think it was uh, Derek and Dave ran into him at Gen Con mm. uh, one year when they were running the uh, Christian Gamers Guild slash 
Gamers for Christ web booth, mm-hmm. and Gary approached them. Okay. And struck up a conversation, I guess, at that point. So that's kind of how it started back then. And uh, he was also online on the Gamers for Christ web forum, which doesn't exist anymore. It hasn't existed for almost what 10 years shame. now. Yeah. But he was on there probably two or three years before he passed away. He was on that forum quite regularly uh, talking about gaming stuff, you know, under his pseudonym, Colonel Puba, Kubo <laughs> or something like that. Colonel Pubo. Anyway. And, and he was on there, and it was him, and he would, a lot of the times, he would just be involved himself in a lot of puns. <laughs> he was just, that was his thing, and he would make a pun out of everything and then just keep it going on a thread. We'd have a whole thread with nothing but Gary and Dave and Jim <laughs> and other people, Dave and uh, Derek, going back and forth about puns, various different puns, and, so yeah, he was on there. We discussed a little bit of theology. We had a, a theology forum. We would talk to him at, at length about different aspects of Christian faith and so forth. So he, his background was really kind of a hodgepodge from what I gathered from talking, from reading what he wrote and interacting with him on those boards. I interacted with him in email like once, once or twice mm-hmm. um, about some of these issues. But basically his background was he was briefly Jehovah's Witness for like 30 seconds. Really? Ser- seriously, like a couple of meetings and gone kind of thing. Wow. And uh, I think his family was involved at one time, but they left. Um, and then I think his JW has officially excommunicated him during the satanic panic and all that. And, really? Which is kind of funny because he hadn't been there in years, um, according to him. See, and, that's the crazy thing is like the, yeah. what I was getting back from Christians was no, this guy wasn't a Christian because he was a Jehovah's Witness. And I'd get mm-hmm. sent screenshots from these Unitarian pages who want to claim him as one of theirs. And so yeah. yeah, I was I was really hoping to hear more about that. No, he was he wasn't Unitarian. He was um he was he was in his own words, he was on the fence about the Trinity and was more had one foot further on the side of Arianism than he had on the side of the Trinity. That's kind of where he was. And as far as I know, he never he never resolved that before he passed away. So whether or not he's in glory or not, I don't know. But he that was where he was. He was he considered himself uh, if you were going to force him into a corner, he would side with Arianism. Mm. But convinced of it either, nor, nor was he convinced of Trinitarianism fully either. He was on the fence. He came to the DD Christ. He still saw Jesus as being divine. He saw Jesus as divine savior. So he wasn't really sure about the, the construct of the Trinity. Mm. And I think part of that was because I don't think he ever had anybody really truly uh, explain it to him correctly, like like you see in like James White's book, right? You know, um, you know the Trinity book that James White wrote, for example, where he clearly lays out the different planks of the Trinity for you, so you can mm-hmm. easily apprehend everything. Gary, I don't think ever, anybody ever actually did that for Gary in that in that manner, and, and so that's why he was always he was kind of in that mode. But I would definitely wouldn't call him a Unitarian. That that that's he was a Unitarian. Yeah. So so you're saying that by the end I, he was pretty much on board with the idea that Jesus was God, even though he didn't quite get the whole schema of the Trinity. Yeah, he was. He was. He he said he believed Jesus was God, but he didn't believe. He didn't know. He didn't think. He thought that Jesus may have been created, but so that's why I see you know some Unitarian people trying to claim he was Unitarian. He definitely was Unitarian, especially if you watch some of the interviews that, that we did with him and, and some of the interaction we had with him. He definitely was would not fit that. Mm-hmm. If anything, he was. Uh, I would say, kind of like to quote MacArthur, use a MacArthurism, 
he was a, a leaky Aryan. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we're hoping he was just a really confused Trinitarian. <laughs> down yeah, either a really confused, either really confused Trinitarian or a leaky Aryan. I think it would be a good way to put it. So, as someone who's been involved with D and D since the earliest days. Um, what sort of changes have you noticed in the community and the nature of the game and the way that it's designed, marketed, published in, with a particular eye toward how that relates to the Christian foundations of it? What are some of those big changes you've seen since the late 70s? Prior to the internet, most role-playing game systems, most game design systems were all brought about through people getting together in local groups and they didn't, they didn't look to the wider audience other than the audience there in that locale, you know, Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, for example. Um, with the advent of the internet, now you've got this huge pool. The more people you can get to play your game and buy your, your merch, the better for you selling the game. And it doesn't matter if it's the best game in the world. What matters is it's the most popular game in the world. So with uh, that approach to marketing and finding a wider audience did you see D, D lose much of its soul did you see those christian roots become even more obscured well yeah because you're you're with with first edition you still had with the baby boomers and gen xers who were playing first edition and early second edition you have this baseline of judeo-christian ethos mm -hmm set of uh, worldview assumptions that are behind the game. Third edition was like this transition edition of the game, um, where we have the new market of the millennials coming up, and the overwhelming worldview backdrop for millennials is postmodernism. When you go to market the game, you're now looking at this new market where we have Gen X who will buy it, because it's D&D, &D. and now you've got the millennials, and we want to appeal to them. And so you start changing things in the game to match that newer worldview backdrop, or the, the, the non-religious, non postmodern worldview. Mm -hmm. And as the game has evolved since third edition, You've seen that more and more in the way that they do English styling, uh, the way they title uh, different things in the game, such as spells and magic items and things like that, uh, the way they're careful with how they use uh, racial terms, gender terms, uh, things like this, are all changed. And it's because of the worldview of the majority worldview of their mark their target market there's one area in particular that i've thought of ever since i got into the bigger D, D community and i see a lot of content creators on youtube talking about how alignment doesn't matter it's an outdated uh sort of way of thinking right whatever else and you were adamant in our earliest discussion that the alignment system was produced from a christian worldview mm -hmm. it was then then Gary made no bones about that. He said, yes, it's a really Christian worldview mm. where you have good versus evil and, and evil's always evil, mm. you know, and good is good. You know, if the terms mean what they mean in, in this worldview context. And uh, that's why you see millennials and the mass majority of them come at it from a postmodern perspective where truth is relative. Truth is relative to the culture or the situation they're in, as opposed to the modernist concept, well, truth is is only relative to its objective standard by which it's measured. And so, of course, they're going to be against alignment because alignment assumes an objective standard. Yeah, fixed points and, by which to measure that sort of thing. And that's you know, there's an objective standard, that. and they don't want an objective standard. I've never played third edition, but I have come across a lot of the books uh, floating around on the internet and for like I, I looked at there's the book of 
exalted goodness and the the tome of vile darkness i think is what they're exalted deeds yeah exalt yeah exalted deeds yeah you're right um and even in those i noticed that there was there was a sense in which alignment was meant to matter a sense in which faith was meant to matter and these are sort of sort of things that are reflected in a mechanical sense but now in fifth edition which is the edition that i've come up playing there's an emphasis on making that more superfluous your alignment doesn't matter as far as mechanics go there's not going to be uh creatures or effects or items or anything like that that have anything to do with whether you are aligned with this objective standard of goodness or this objective standard of evil um there's there's uh there's there's a push for getting away from what they view as some kind of biological essentialism where it's like well maybe the maybe the orcs are just misunderstood (laughs) maybe oh yeah you can you can be good if you're a devil like (laughs) you know this sort of this sort of a thing um so many attempts to muddy the waters ever since i've started paying attention to where the game was and where it was even 20 years ago and then where it is today yeah and 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 you understand in some of those early books those 33 ebooks you got the the book of exalted deeds and the book of wild darkness and both of them had uh parental advisory warnings on them when they Mm -hmm. first came out they had the little sticker parental advisory warning sticker on them so that was interesting because they talked about subject matter in there that you don't want your kids reading. You know, it's talking about rape and things like that and and how they're evil. Yeah. Um, duh. And so you hmm. um, what's interesting is James Wyatt, who wrote. Just did nothing but write for 3e i mean they got they i think they locked him in a room and said here's your next project and they never let him out uh because he wrote like 90 percent of all their stuff after after the core books um he he's a united methodist pastor i just wanted to say i appreciate you uh, being willing to carve out two hours to talk to me about all this fun stuff and yeah it's been a pleasure I think I'm going to hop you, off of here and uh, spend yeah, some time. Yeah, I'll let you go. Life. I need to get going too. <laughs> All so right. Thank you again. And so you how have the dispensationalist Nazi Mormon orcs. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's incredible. <laughs> <laughs>